Welcome to Kingdom Passive Income, a podcast about entrepreneurs who discovered their dreams and how to fund it by partnering with God in creative ways. Each week, we deliver the best-in-class examples of stewardship of resources and ideas to inspire you to take the next step with what's in your hand. Now, here's your host, Eric Skeldon. What's up? Hey, what's going on, Joseph? Welcome to Kingdom Passive Income, and we have a special guest all the way from the future, 15 hours ahead. He's one of the leaders of a group called the Embassy and um, Fuse Life, and they're just doing some powerful things in their country and um, with online training, teaching about sonship and being a warrior and actually um, living a full, full, whole, holistic life um, in the Lord, whether it's your health, your wealth, your marriage. And I love that approach because I see so many people just be like, get your money up, become rich. And then I see them get a divorce, see them, you know, still hooked on drugs. And, and so I love that you're uh, tackling all that. Um, so for people who don't know you, um, can we hear, I, I read uh, some of your page today on your, uh, on your challenge. And so tell a little bit about that us about your story, your origin story and, how Joseph Wilson became, you know, a coach, an author, and a speaker, and how did that all come about? Man, well, firstly, thank you for having me on episode one. It's an honor, yeah. and um, yeah, I pray that whatever you're doing here with the Lord will expand and explode in a good way. <laughs> Amen. So, my name is Joseph. I am 34 years old. I live in Auckland, New Zealand. I was originally born in India. And uh, my whole family moved here when I was 11 years old. So I feel like I pretty much grew up here. And um, currently I am married. I have three beautiful children. One has just turned eight weeks old. So my house is full on at the moment. <laughs> eight weeks. Wow. Eight Great. weeks. Yeah. You have you have girls, right? Four girls? Four girls. Um, youngest Esther is uh, nine, nine months. So Esther, that's interesting that that's her name. Yeah. So yeah, I have three girls. And then four with my wife. So wow. similar kind of story. Here. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for me, long story short, we came here. I grew up around a Christian home. I mean, I saw the religion, saw the hypocrisy. I didn't see anything real. I didn't see anything raw. I didn't see anything powerful. So I didn't want anything to do with it. And as I grew older, I started to drink and party and do all that stuff. And I got invited to this Pentecostal church and that was the first time I ever walked into a church where people were so happy and pumped. And I remember walking in and the lights were kind of dim and people were dancing and the worship leaders, like they, they were so happy and they were barely opening their eyes. And I, I thought they were on drugs, man. Like <laughs> they were just too, yeah. it just was so different to what I thought church was supposed to be, you know? So I was like, man, this is interesting. What's going on here? And then the pastor was preaching. Then he prayed for some people and they fell down. And I was like, what the heck is this? Like, what's he doing? And uh, the guy I was with didn't allow me to go up. I wanted to go up and, you know, let him put his hand on me and see if this is real. And the guy I was with freaked out. And he was like, no, we got to go. We got to go. And <laughs> so he was my ride. So I, I left. Now, looking back, I know that that was like the devil trying to hold on to me, you know. So, from that first time that I went to that church to the third time I went, it was probably about eight weeks, six to eight weeks. The drinking got worse, the partying got worse, all these opportunities to do dumb things just showed up, you know. And um, it was almost like my life was spiraling the wrong way, even faster. And, um, this one day, it was June 8th, 2008, I decided to drive to this church and I drove. I was still drunk from the night before. I don't know why I went, but I went. I sat in the back seat and I was still a bit wasted, a bit munted. And uh, this girl started to sing a prophetic song. She was on her knees in the front, just singing to God on her own. And as she sang, I felt a heat go through my body and I sobered up. And there was no one near me. And I remember freaking out and um like I just could hear God start speaking to me and speaking to me about my life, my childhood. And I just started to weep, you know. And then I said to him, man, if this is you and you're really real, then show me and I'll give you my life. And in the next 30 days, I saw these miracles. I saw these crazy things at this church. And 
I gave him my life and I haven't looked back since. So that's the story. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. I didn't know that um, you kind of had, yeah, you and I both kind of had a similar, like, like I was raised in the church as well. Uh, you know, just was in the church, worked in the big churches in Texas, mega churches, and um, and then ended up, you know, going for three years, you know, selling pounds of marijuana and, you know, flunking out of school and just all this stuff. And God, you know, on the side of the highway, you know, state troopers, I prayed and said, if you get me out of this, you know, the predicament. And then and after, you know, 30 minutes of prayer and all these state troopers, they're about to bust me. I've never been in trouble before. Got like all up the ranks without ever getting in trouble. And, um, and as I was praying, I was like, if you're real and this isn't just, you know, a big charade, then, uh, you know, I will like come and rescue me and I'll know Jesus is real and I'll follow you the rest of the days of my life. And the, after, after that, um, the state trooper came back up and was like, son, today's your lucky day. All the drug dogs are sick. Hurry up and go home before I change my mind. And, and so that, after that, I just, yeah, just started following. Crazy. Him. So, yeah. wow. So in the, the churches out there, um, so the churches, the you you went to just a lot of churches that were just kind of what do you say mainstream and they just believe. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading one of the comments and uh, people are so used to seeing me interview people. <laughs> I can see some people um, making reference to that, but nice. Um, For some reason, I'm yeah, not like comments on the on the B Live. Yeah, normally the comments come up here, so I don't know what happened, why they're not here, but. Normally, I can see them. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, most churches that I'd been to were traditional religious or traditional, you know, ma mainstream. There are a couple of big churches here, you know, 1,000 or 3,000, nothing like um, where you are, obviously. But, yeah, they were pretty mainstream. And um, there was nothing crazy going on. This church that I went to that I got saved there was, it was crazy. Like, mm -hmm. probably 60 to 70% of people that were saved got saved in that church so it wasn't like you know other believers came to that church you no know, people came there and encountered god like ex-drug addicts and prostitutes and it was it was a powerful place man wow and i'm noticing a trend of that with this, these people in new zealand so is it is there just like what's in the water out there that everyone <laughs> i see so many spiritual people starting to rise up out there in training and leading new so zealand's an interesting country there? like we our nation is four and a half million strong so we're tiny but we've been used to fighting above our weight this whole time you know if you look at sport you look at different things there's like kiwis are either totally suppressed and shut down or the ones they fight because the truth is there's a lot of tall poppy syndrome here in this nation like when you start to do well people will shut you down suppress you push you down whatever it's there it's real but that's probably the reason why those that push through that they end up going and doing great things you know so new zealand has this pedigree of sending so many missionaries all around the world uh, we have some amazing people that have come from this nation and then obviously even people like uh, edmund hillary who climbed mount everest is from here and then you got the all blacks so everybody knows the all blacks you know so we're doing well for a small nation we fight above our weight we got pioneers in this nation wow that's amazing so, and so as you know, this is also a podcast on entrepreneurship and how to, you know, do kingdom entrepreneurship, how to, you know, live a life where you can do something you're passionate about. And we want to wake up believers to believe in the dreams inside, whether it was, I want to be, you know, own a bakery or I want to, you know, be a, you know, a singer or a public speaker, but then the world crushed them down, religion crushed them down, the law crushed them down. Maybe their friends they hung out with, you know, said, Hey, just smoke weed here, take this alcohol. You're never going to do anything with your life. And so how, you know, how to, what's your encouragement for how to overcome, you know, friendships and people who will try to hold you down? And also um, what has been your, you know, journey to enter in entrepreneurship with the Lord? And how has he talked to you about, you know, you know, becoming a coach and doing all fitness and tell us a little bit more about what you do day to day with um, different businesses? Hey, you, you packed a lot into this. <laughs> that was a loaded question. Um, we're, yeah, so let me start with what I remember, and then you can kind of guide me through here. But when I encountered God, I was like, okay, you know what? Here is my life. Have it. What are we doing? And so I started to practice obedience. I believe that obedience is the mark of a son. Everybody needs to live by obedience. You know, Christianity, the religion is very outcome focused. It's very outcome based. It's always about what you can get, what you can do. It isn't actually about intimacy. It isn't actually about relationship. But when this thing began for me, 
I pretty much gave up my whole life. So I stopped clubbing, stopped partying, stopped hanging out with those friends, even though they would message me. There was something in me that was drawing me to what I suddenly saw was real. You know, I was like, man, if God is real, then I'm giving him everything. So I lost a lot of friends in that early time. And um, I left my old life behind and slowly started to build this life with God. So I didn't necessarily have too much of a fight in terms of some of the things that you're talking about. But what happens is when you start being obedient, God starts to train you and you don't even realize that you're being trained. So this challenge that I'm running, the purpose challenge, which everybody should join, I, I look at two aspects. I look at Joseph in the Bible and then Esther in the Bible. Now, Joseph was being trained and he didn't even know. And when he finished his training, he got promoted to a position. But if he was to look back in his life, he would see the training right from when he was a child. And then you have Esther, on the other hand, who gets nudged by her cousin, Mordecai, and he pushes her into training. So here is one person who got trained, didn't realize. And then here is another person who actively engaged tra training and she accelerated into her destiny and she was able to save a whole generation um, in terms of Esther. So, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your questions here, but there's quite yeah. a few that, questions you asked. But <laughs> yeah. So so as you, you know, as you were, you know, like, OK, God, I want to be obedient. I want to follow you. But for me, you know, and as you started having kids, a big question is money. You know, I want my wife to be able to spend time with our kids and raise them and train them. But then at the same time, it's like, you know, for me, I was out in the corporate, you know, world and I, you know, I did really well. I got a business degree. God said, finish what you started, go get a business degree. So I went and got a business degree and I went in corporate world, um, did well in the corporate world. But there was always you'll get to a level where it's like you start having to make uh, compromises on like, oh, you know, there's always this like fine line where it's just of, of corporate corporations that I found. Even I was, you know, I, I did millions of dollars in sales for two companies and, you know, started making good money. But then there always got a time where God was just testing you like, you know, what what is more important? Is it? And and so what has that journey been like for you as far as making money and how to do it in something where you love and how to what does God talk to you about that? Well, when I first encountered God, I gave him everything, right? That means I gave him my money too. So I was a door knocker at that time. I was a door-to-door -door sales guy and uh, I was selling cable TV. So during that time, my pastor would say things like, hey, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. And he showed it to me in Mark 16, you know? And so I would lay hands on the sick. I saw miracles, saw people getting saved, people getting healed. Wow. It was an amazing time of me learning that the Bible was real. But during that time, I was on a commission only um, structure. So if I didn't make any sales, I would get no money. And I remember God specifically training me during that season, like, hey, Joseph, do you still love me if you get no sales today? Do you love me the same if you got five sales today? And there were times when I'd get five sales, I'd be like, yeah, man, thank you, Jesus. We're doing it. I'm doing it right. You know, we're one. Yeah. And then some days I get no sale. I'll be driving back home like, where were you, God? Like, what did I do wrong? What's going on? And in that time, he started to teach me how to flatline. I believe every believer needs to learn how to flatline. And uh, this flatline is where you start to rely on who God is instead of who you are. Mm -hmm. Flatline is where you start to rely on his nature, on his word, on who on. he says he is, not on who you are, not on your emotions, not on your ability, not on your talent, none of that. When you learn how to flatline, then nothing can shift you. So what do I mean by flatline? The Bible says that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's a flatline. He doesn't change. He's he's in all. Everything was made for him. He's not affected by things. And so he started to train me to, to step into that place and stay in that place. So when I think of finances, I'm like, you know, the world, the spirit of mammon, and Jesus talked about this. This is the only thing he said rivals the spirit of God is the spirit of mammon. Spirit of mammon is so real and so seductive and is constantly trying to pull people. And so whenever I see people stuck in the fear of do I have enough for my bills and the anxiety and the worry, the very things that Jesus told us not to get stuck in, you know that that's part of the spirit of mammon that's pulling you in. And so even the desire to be rich and to be wealthy and I'm totally not telling you that God doesn't want us to be wealthy. He does. He's called people to be wealthy. He's called people to be blessed. But the heart motive, 
the heart behind it defines everything. And so I've seen people that will say they're Christians in business, but they want to just be rich. They want to have this money. What for? They don't even know, you know? And um, so the very thing that God wants to put in your life to use to change the world can become the thing the devil uses to own you. And so when it comes to finances, man, I'm like, you it's no different to any other area of life i mean look at now what's happening with this covid thing the whole world's on lockdown if you don't learn how to flatline the fear is going to get you the worry is going to get you you know so i don't know how deep i should go on this but yes i'm answering your question no that's very helpful and that's that's something you know that god has really dealt with me because my generation for generation has just been you know like oh we got to hoard money if we're going to have it and it was always the poverty mindset dealing with the poverty mindset for generations and you and it and in the kingdom it's like upside down and it's not logical and i've always you know my dad was a cpa he was an mba worked for jp morgan and so he was all about hoarding but it never worked out for him and yeah. so, and so I learned that like, oh, babe, if we're going to survive, you know, on one income, we got to just hoard and hoard. And, you know, God had to really just have me give over my, where I was just like, they call it that, that factor where you're like, oh God, are you, am I really going to do this? And, and then it, and it just started breaking stuff off and I'm still, it's still, there's like Pedro said, you know, getting that next, you know, level of, of where your poverty spirit is like, God, do I believe you for this? So tell me, tell me what is, what does sonship look like? Like, what is the definition of sonship and how do people listening, how do they enter into that flat line? Sonship is so, like, it's so deep. It's so interesting because everybody has this different view. But for me, it's really, really simple. It's like you just walk with your father. You learn how to have relationship with your father in heaven and you just walk it out every day. I think it's really fascinating that when the disciples saw Jesus's life, they knew that when he prays, something happens. And that's why they asked him, teach us how to pray. How do you pray? And the first thing he says to them is start with this, our father, our father. Because if you can know him as Papa, if you can know him as daddy, if you can know him as father, then everything else, the provider, the healer, the warrior, the protector, everything else comes with that. You know, I'm a dad to three little girls and they just know me as dad. But by knowing me as dad, they already by default, they know that the fridge is going to have food, that they can go to bed safe at night. They're going to have clothes on their birthdays. They're going to get gifts. They know all this stuff, but they don't look at me as a provider. They don't look at me as the guy that feeds them. They don't look at me as the guy that plays with them. They just look at me as Papa. And as Papa, I can be all things to them. And this is what I believe Jesus was trying to say is that when you start to connect with him as Papa, he will be all things to you. And so he becomes my business advisor. He becomes my career counselor. He becomes my marriage counselor. He becomes my personal trainer. He becomes everything because he is everything. There is no knowledge. There is nothing that exists outside of him. And so even when I look at my journey as he trained me to flatline, which he's training everyone, don't get your value from what you do. And um, so sometimes you go through a hard time and that's part of your training of God going, hey, don't get your value from what's going on. Get your value from me. All right. And so this training process is like now I'm 12 years in the Lord. I still don't know the exact amount of money I'm going to make on a Thursday. OK, Thursday is usually payday here, but I don't know what I'm going to make. And honestly, I don't care. Because my business doesn't pay me, the government doesn't pay me, my clients don't pay me, God takes care of me. And so he's built it like that, you know, and um, I think a lot of people, they don't want to let go and you need to let go. If you want everything that God has for you, you're going to have to let go of everything the world is trying to suck you in with. Wow, that's I that's deep. That's powerful. And so... So that uh, my wife is, she's super excited because she she loves Chris Blackaby and um, <laughs> and Chris Blackaby and um, what is it Justin Justin something Justin Abraham, Abraham yeah Justin Abraham and you know and just their stories every time she hears their stories about like oh I, I was working at a bank and then I took a I took a month off and I just stopped working and God just provided since then and she's like we need to do that let's just let's just you know and but during this COVID nineteen it's like 
and I've been reading your articles. You've been saying, what if COVID was, you know, you know, seven series or whatever, what if COVID was the best thing for you? Because now everything that we've been putting as an idol football, um, our, our job, our identity, our career, a lot of those things have been stripped from us. And now we're in a season where we have to look and focus on God. And we only have, we only have the Bible and we only have, Lord, I have you, I have my family and I, you know, I have a roof over my head for now. What, how do I flatline? How do I just rely on you? You are my provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are, you are the King. You are the, you know, and so that's, I feel like this is a great awakening of people understanding God really is trying to deliver us from that. But in order to deliver us, we have to look at that and be able to even, you know, what's your thoughts on is, is the repentance involved for giving those things an idol? What is, what is some steps for some people listening? How do we, how do we, how do we do this? And, you know, be like, God, this, but, you're my, yeah, I get you. I get you. But I want to say something because I think many people do not fully give themselves to this fact, right? Romans, I think it's Romans 5, 8. It says that when I was still fully deep seeped in my sin, mm -hmm. he sent his son to die for me. And this is the true gospel. Nobody wants to share this part. But God didn't come and save Joseph because Joseph was a good boy or had potential to be a good boy. He saved Joseph purely because he loved Joseph. He loves Joseph. If we don't understand that, then even repentance, like what is repentance? What does that even mean? You know, that was Jesus's message. Jesus's message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But Christianity has turned it into repent means cry and feel bad about your sin and feel bad about your actions and, and you should really mean it from your heart and we've turned it into all the stuff but actually the greek word for repentance just metanoia is it to change the way you think turn it around change the way you think about the subject because the kingdom of god is at hand so most christianity doesn't even talk about the kingdom i mean even the way we do church is wasn't jesus's plan it wasn't I mean, I, I don't want to go so deep into this thing, but a lot of what we've learned as church is not, it's not real. It's not Jesus' yeah. plan. That's why there's not victory. Like when you say to me, oh man, the lockdown means I've just got me and God and my Bible. That was always his plan. His plan was always that it was just you and him. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing, and this is why I'm running this purpose challenge and I'm challenging people who always thought that their destiny in God looked churchy. It looked Christian. But I don't believe that that's the case, you know, and and so God wired Eric a certain way that he was going to bring something to the earth in 2020 that might have nothing to do with the church, that might have nothing to do with ministry. He might have been called to do something, even though in his heart he's walking with Jesus, he was called to do something that many pastors probably won't even agree with. And we haven't made room for any of that. OK, I'm going to give you an example, OK? john the baptist i mean how many churches today would would allow john the baptist to be in their membership here's a guy in the bush a mm -hmm. voice crying out in the wilderness wearing camels here eating locusts and honey there's no room for people like that but he had a massive call and this guy knew his assignment what was his assignment there was a man coming greater than i and when he comes i'm going to build this ministry when he comes i'm handing my ministry over to him and as soon as he sees jesus and this is the power of knowing your purpose. You know where you belong. Suddenly, you know where everyone else belongs. And so he sees Jesus and he's like, there is the guy. There is the man. Right. And then you just play your role. And this is the misconception with purpose. People get identity and assignment confused. Purpose is made out of these two things. You need to know your identity. Yeah, you're a son. But then you have an assignment. You have a role. Both of them need to come together for why you're on earth. Jesus was... Uh, was the son of God. He came down. That was his identity. He was I mean, God in the flesh, really. But then he had an assignment. He had an assignment he had to fulfill. And so everything we're talking about right now, even COVID, whatever happens in the world cannot stop your assignment. Judas couldn't stop Jesus' assignment. Nobody could stop Jesus' assignment. Nobody can stop your assignment. The problem is we've taken church thinking institutionalized thinking and try to get our assignment to submit to that. But that is a box. In, religion in itself is a box. How am I going to put my calling into this box and try and feel free? It's not going to happen. 
And that's where I believe God's called me to break some of these things, some of these wrong thinking and stuff like that. So that's sorry, awesome. I'm getting a bit excited here, but yes, you are. Hey, <laughs> we love it. People, people, yeah, that's that's a big passion of mine is this breaking mindsets, breaking limiting beliefs off yourself. And um, man, just even do this. So you encouraged me. You're just like, hey man, let's just knock it out. Let's get this. And you know, I was kind of like, oh, kind of like, man, things are getting busy, starting, I'm starting a new um remote job you know this and that and you know always trying to put something off to the future your assignment and it's like but god's been saying this since chris valentin spoke and he was like your biggest fear right now is public speaking or you know whatever your biggest fear is name it and that's what you need to go do and so i've been i've been kind of just in this place of like god what what does this look like because that's big been my biggest fear you know i, I was good at one-on-one -on -one sales and talking to people on the phone cold calling but whenever i had to speak in front of a stage that's why I like it online a little bit better. Uh, uh, so Pedro's, Pedro's been right. doing 30-day challenge, and it helps me because I go online and I see people comment. Maybe some people, someone puts an angry face. So I'm like, oh, God, that didn't, <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> but other than that, I, I can't, you know, I don't feel too much pressure. But so so you talked let, about. Let me, let, me hit, let me hit one thing that you mentioned here, that public speaking, right? A lot of people are scared of public speaking. And they say it's one of the biggest fears in the world. But here is my question. How many people constitute public like how, how many people do you need for it to become public mm -hmm. because if you're speaking to 10 people and some of them are your friends maybe at your birthday party and your mom and your dad and your wife and your kids that's public and you speak there and you have no fear no worry see i don't believe people have a public speaking problem they have a fear of being judged the wow, fear yeah. is if you see me for who i am you might not like me and if you don't like me my world's gonna shatter and that's the problem. And that's the thing we got to address. When I was a kid, I was put on stage and I was part of dramas and skits and all this kind of stuff. And as I grew older and I came to New Zealand, the culture here is different. There's a lot of false humility. That's a lot of, there's a lot of hiding. And so I developed that. And uh, when I was 20, 21, I was part of a network marketing company called Yusana. I was in MLM. And um, the lady, this lady got up at a conference and she said, if anybody faces their fear over the next three days of this conference i have a prize for them and straight away i knew my fear was public speaking at that time it developed right mm -hmm. so that lunchtime after the session finished i went straight up i grabbed the mic and i said to everybody this is my fear public speaking i'm smashing it right here no more you know i remember that moment it was like wow. i chose to put a stake in the ground and i wasn't even saved at that time but i was like i'm not gonna let this thing dominate me so when you are talking about what you're saying, right, and why I encourage you to do this podcast, and I'm always telling people you got to take action. There are two parts to you stepping into your purpose. One is you explore. You explore as a son. See, my daughters today, I mean, in lockdown, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're exploring games. They're exploring the house. They're exploring their relationship with me and my wife. They're always exploring. As, as a daughter, she can explore as much as she wants she will always be my daughter. So she's free to make mistakes. So many Christians are scared of making mistakes. People will not step into their purpose because they're scared of making mistakes. We got to deal with that thing. And the second part is engage. You got to explore and then engage. So Eric says, man, maybe there's a podcast in me. Boom, he's exploring. Yeah, I think there's a podcast. Okay, it's time to engage. But what if it goes wrong? What if I only do three episodes? What if I look like a Muppet? What if I do five episodes? What if nobody wants to come on podcast with me? Who cares? This is how you step into your purpose. You explore, you engage, and eventually you will step into the full expression. So these are four E's. If you're listening to me, you gotta listen. You got to explore. You got to engage. While you're doing that, you got to enjoy enjoy what enjoy your papa enjoy walking it out and then finally you will end up in the expression of who god called you to be right now i am the expression and for some people i'm too much for some people i'm not enough if i live my life based on people i will never be what i was always supposed to be okay so explore engage enjoy express Boom. wow Come on. So I just dropped in the comments, fusebornformore.com uh, slash pop challenge. And pop I put it challenge in the because it's called pursue on purpose. You need to pursue on purpose. <laughs> wow. And so t tell us a little bit more about purpose and what is what does purpose mean? How do you know if you 
are living a life full of purpose and how do you know if you're living out your identity and how do you you know know what your assignment you know how do you even know what your assignment is do you just try things out and if it you know there's anointing on it you keep it going or so i think people complicate this way too much right if know, you think about I, purpose yeah so a lot of people think you know i gotta go find my purpose i gotta go find it and it's somewhere out there it's something i'm gonna do and that's the first lie of this whole thing psalms 139 says that he formed you right he was forming you in your mother's womb before he even formed you he had a thought he had an idea and within eric within his molecular structure god put purpose the way Eric thinks, the way he acts, the way he talks, so many things have purpose attached to it. So your purpose is not what you're going to go and do somewhere. It's actually already in you. You came wow. with it. Come you on. came wired with it. And the more you allow this exploring, this engaging, this enjoying, this expression to take place, it will start to unleash itself. So too many people get stuck on that. Like, oh, what should it look like? And because Christianity is so outcome-based, we're always looking for the outcome, like, oh, was that good? Was it bad? And and like, for example, you do this podcast and it only has 20 views, right? We all get mm -hmm. sucked into this. You might go, man, was that even God? It only had 20 views. Like, if it was the Lord, it should have 200,000 views. Like, it's probably not the Lord. And we are so outcome-based. God is not outcome-based. He's raising sons who are going to be obedience-based. Obedience-based. So there is... That, if you take purpose and you try and think of it in the world worldly way, it means like impact looks like big numbers. You have to be famous and there has to be glory and it has to be like so big that everybody can see. But God doesn't go like that. Jesus was sitting there watching the woman who just put her two mites. See, mm -hmm. God's eye is not on, on the things that our eyes are on. You know, there was a time where I was in a public toilet. I'm going to share this with you, okay? And I walked in and there was like wet, yucky toilet paper on the ground. And I, anyway, so I do my thing and I'm washing my hands, about to leave and God's like, pick up that paper. And I'm like, what? What paper? You know? <laughs> and um, I look down. It's nasty. I don't want to pick that thing up. <laughs> and I remember having this battle with him about not wanting to pick up his paper. And I had all the reasons. I mean, this is not my paper. I don't know where that paper's been. I don't, why do I, the council's going to clean it, God. What, what do you, you know? And I go through this journey and this is what I'm meaning. Like purpose isn't actually about what you're doing and the little things that you do. It's actually about who you are and how much you allow that out. And your purpose can look like a podcast. It can look like a book. It can look like picking up toilet paper from the ground. It can look like buying groceries for the person behind you. It can look like buying, it's so, so different. But when you're living in purpose, you will be alive. You will be alive. Like right now, okay, see what I'm doing right now with you, I know I was born to do it. You could wake me up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., get me on a podcast, and I will be just like this. It's in my blood. I was created for this thing, and it doesn't make me more special. This is just a fish swimming in water. And when wow. people are happy enough to find their water if they're a fish or jump off the cliff if they're a bird, and just start to fly, just start to enjoy the process. You buy, you can't help but end up in what you would call your purpose in your assignment. So I want to simplify this thing. Okay, too many people are getting caught up on this stuff. Two parts to your purpose: identity and assignment. Your identity is in God. When you, uh, you know, you're a son, right? And there's no gender and spirit. You can be a woman and be a son. When you're a son, then you're like your dad. That was what Jesus said. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That means that if you are walking with your Father, you will manifest Jesus and you will manifest the Father everywhere you go. That means the supernatural stuff, the healing, the miracle, the raise the dead, cleanse the leper, that's all just normal. That's a byproduct. Do you get what I'm saying? Like Christianity has taken that and made that the pinnacle. That is not the pinnacle. That's a byproduct of who you are in God. And then from there, you step into your assignment. Jesus steps into his assignment as savior he steps into his assignment as savior of the world right and so eric will step into assignment as something joseph is stepping into his assignment as a pioneering father that's my assignment that's my role a pioneering father and i'm embracing it i'm stepping into it so when god says write a book joseph i write a book 
in, in two months, the book was out. It was published, right? Because he's calling me to be a pioneering father. He's like, start a podcast. I start a podcast. But this whole time, I've been fathering a whole bunch of people into their purpose. And so when you start to do these four E's, you can't help but fall into your assignment. So I'm trying not to go too crazy into this, but hopefully I answered some questions. <laughs> Yeah, we got some people getting some major breakthrough. So I didn't come across this on accident. Total confirmation on what God is calling me to do. So what you're speaking right now is helping people, um, you know, step further into their calling and confirmation. And that's why I'm just like, Lord, let, let you know, the people that are I'm trying to pull the gold out, pull the treasure out, let that be on display for, for people to see, you know, it's, I mean, and it's the littlest things that, you know, I feel like those details were, we get that really sparks us, you know, and really pushes us forward. And it's it's not always the thus say the Lord, you're gonna be the next international prophet and you know. And so so let's see, what so kids, you have four kids, you said, right? I got three. Three daughters. I believe that's because he's calling me to be part of a woman's empowerment that's about wow. to sweep the world. I believe that women have been suppressed. And pushed down for so long, even in the church, even now there are people that will pull out these scriptures and tell you why a woman should minister and all that kind of stuff. That I believe that women have been shut down so much that for a season the seesaw has to go the other way, so yeah. then it can balance out. And so there is about to be a rise of the woman. There's about to be a rise of Esthers, Esthers yes. that have been through preparation that now are going to petition the king on behalf of a generation. There's going to be a rise of your Deborahs and a rise of your Annas. There's going to be a rise of these, these women that are going to step into their purpose and their power. And so I have three girls, and, and obviously I'm married to my wife. There's four. When I was growing up, I had two sisters and my mom. So there's always these women around me. And uh, being a youth pastor, there's a lot of girls in our youth group, and I can feel God just pulling me to empower these Esthers to step into their purpose. So. Wow, yeah. that's so powerful, and and that was really big for me. I was like, you know, at first when I we, my wife would found out she we found out she was pregnant with our oldest Ziana um, when I was at Airborne School in Fort Benning, Georgia, um, jumping out of planes. And um, anyways, I see I was like I kind of had that mindset like, oh, you have to have a son, and they got to take on care of your name. And God just wrecked me, gave me four daughters, and like, and I'm just like like just teaching them, you know, how to be princess warriors. And I, and I, I just had this so much false perception of, you know, fatherhood and, you know, you need to, you know, teach them to be tough and, you know, discipline and military. Cause that's what our Hispanic or Mexican, we had a grandfather who was in the air force. who was all strict. And, and then even my South Africa, my dad's from Johannesburg, South Africa, and very, wow. just like very logical and obey. Mm -hmm. You have to work to get, you know, you need to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a business. I wanted to go to school for radio, television, and film. He's like, no, business. He's like, that stuff, you barely get a job. And so, anyways, so that's, I, I totally am feeling what, the, you know, and that's why when um, last July 4th, when our um, fourth daughter was coming, you know, I felt the Lord say, you know, ask, praying for the name. And he, he gave me the name Esther last uh, July 4th. And he said that she was going to be a voice to the voiceless. And, um, and then even one of the nurses from Africa was like, she's going to be an ambassador. And then, and then we had someone else who had a, um, who had a dream about Esther and said, uh, I see her being a speaker of the house. I'm like, oh, okay, these words are getting crazy, but I do believe, you know, I mean, right now we have a speaker of the house in America, Nancy Pelosi, she's a female and she's, I don't know if she's doing the best job, but we do have people, you know, even Paula White is, um, Trump's, you know, intercessor prayer person. And it's a blonde female who, you know, very prophetic, very like she's she was on stage like um, like talking about taking down the demons of the deep state and the the demons that are trying to you know principalities who are taking down government and I see these like these super bold women who people don't like a lot of the church in America will be like you know that they'll say oh Paul said this or they'll quote some scriptures that women aren't supposed to speak and yeah and also I wanted to talk to you about the fivefold ministry you know I, I've heard I've heard people say you know, and when it, well, you know, the, we had the apostles with Jesus, you know, then prophets, all that stuff. And now it's kind of gone backwards. It like went backwards. And now we're getting back to where we have prophets and, you know, prophets and apo the ap apostolic. So what do you, what's your take on the apostolic and prophetic and, you know, the coming 
you know, of what God's doing right now? Man, I think I think it's really, really important. Like some people believe that that age is gone, but I don't think so. I think um, they are needed. Obviously, they have a role, and their role is to equip the body for ministry. And I think for a lot of years, they didn't do that because, for example, if, if I get my identity from my position, then I don't want you to grow into doing what I do because it will threaten me. So I would rather you always be a student and never come into the fullness. So then you'll always need me. And this comes back to the first thing that you said. Now in the lockdown, you have your Bible, you have your family and you have God and that's it. And that was always supposed to be the plan. So the fivefold's job is to train everybody else to step into the fullness. They're supposed to train themselves out of a job. And I don't think many do that. There are there are a few now rising up that are doing that, who don't get their identity from their position. They don't get their identity from their role. So they want others to step into it. You know, it's intriguing to me that um, Paul said there's so many instructors and not many fathers because a father's way of thinking is very different to a an instructor's way. You know, an instructor just wants to pass on knowledge, may, you know, maybe some wisdom here and there and teach you things. But a father wants to pass on a heart, you know. So when you're an instructor, you, you can learn knowledge here and pass it on there. But when you're a father, you have to get the father's heart to pass on the father's heart. And so the fivefold with the father's heart is so powerful because that's what's going to change the world. The fivefold with an instructor's heart is very different. And so whatever happens here in terms of the fivefold, sonship and knowing who a person is in God, it has to be the baseline, like the foundation, so that we can actually see the fullness. You know, that, this is just my opinion. Obviously, I don't claim to know everything, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And Man, I've just been seeing, you know, in Wichita, I've seen people, you know, business people, successful business people. And, you know, they'll go, you know, go to drop everything and go to BSSM and go become a student and go learn. And and like just different like things that I wouldn't think, you know, would happen of like people in their 40s and 50s that are successful would like go and want to, you know, learn more about the Lord and how to how to, you know, do this kind of stuff. Um, as far as, you know, schooling, what's your, what's your thoughts on schooling, whether it's ministry and even, um, you know, business degrees versus like self-education, like, Hey, buy a course on Amazon fulfillment and, you know, learn how to do that. What do you think is kind of the future coming with that? So with, um, with the schooling, let me answer the second part first. Like, I think like. I went to university. I spent forty thousand dollars on my scholar. Uh, what, what do you call it? My um, uh, student tuition. loan. <laughs> yeah, student, yeah, loan. My student loan. And um, you know, I'm glad I went because I found my wife there. <laughs> but mm -hmm. at that time, my heart was not for education because I was just studying for the sake of studying. Because then I was going to go get a job. As the entrepreneur thing started to burn in me, education took on new meaning. Like now, I'll study for hours because I really want to study. You know, I've mm. paid thousands of dollars to mentors and coaches because they've saved me so much time. So my recommendation is that you do grab mentors, you do grab coaches, you're going to learn things supernaturally, like from osmosis, you're going to learn things um, directly, like in terms of knowledge and tactics and strategies. But that would be my recommendation, you find a mentor, find somebody that's living in the realm you want to live in, that's doing what you want to do. And then you pay them because money is one way that you show value you pay them and then you get with them on what they're doing, you know, 100x. So Eric and I are part of 100x. 100x has radically, radically impacted my life, right? It's impacted yeah. my life supernaturally, not even in the ways that that mentor wanted it to impact me. You know, so Pedro, who's the mentor here, is, he's impacting people in ways he can't control. It is totally the Lord. So that's what I would tell you if you are if you are wanting to get into this space. Um, in terms of learning, go, go get a coach, you know, go get a coach. Yeah. And uh, if you don't know, or if you're unsure of your purpose, then jump into my purpose challenge because it's free. You're going to learn stuff. And the, it's the challenge. That's also free. <laughs> awesome. And so in the purpose challenge, the four E's, what are the four E's again? And can you go over a little bit about what, what they're going to get out of that? that the, the four E's are kind of the last step. I'm going to break down so much of the religious thinking that has already affected people. Even the concept of waiting on God, like the way people say, well, I'm waiting on God. 
Most mm. people think that they're waiting on God to do something. They're waiting for the angels to show up. They're waiting for their purpose to be written on the wall. They're waiting mm. for the inferior. The superior has already been done, which is you were created with purpose, on purpose, for a purpose. That is more superior than having an external visitation that's going to try and tell you something. This thing's deep. And um, so I'm just going to break down some of the religious thinking that's coming in the way of people's exploration time. Um, I'm going to break down some of the identity issues that stop people because they're scared of making mistakes. And um, then we'll go into the explore, engage, enjoy, express the, the four E's that you end up in as you step into your, your assignment. You know, I want to, I want to say something. Let me say this. I will say this to you. Okay. When you start stepping into your purpose, everything is going to shift the speed at which your life goes, how you make your decisions, how, how you wake up every day, how you go to bed every day, everything changes. It becomes easier in some ways. It becomes more fun. One of the biggest things I've seen in my own life as I've embraced my, my personal purpose, my assignment, is that I don't compare myself to other people anymore. There was a time, a season in my life where I would find myself comparing myself to someone and thinking that I should be like them. I wish I was like them. Like I remember when I first got saved, I thought I had to be like every minister. It's like, oh, look at David Hogan, man. He spends hours praying and fasting. I mm -hmm. should be praying and fasting. Look at Heidi Baker. And I would, uh, times where I locked myself in the room and tried to pray, and I couldn't pray for hours because I wasn't in that place. And, and then being frustrated and feeling like I'm not good enough and then being like, man, well, how can God use me if I can't even pray for six hours straight, if I can't even fast for three days? And all this wrong thinking, okay? Now, you look at my daughters, three of them are so unique, and I am raising them up in their own way. But the bottom line is, I love you. You're my child. Let's enjoy each other, explore, engage, and you express who you are. And because of that, they are accelerating in everything. So my first daughter, she loves reading. She's very intellectual. She's read over 100 of her little books, you know, the small storybooks. She's four years old. She's read over 100 of them. And she can emotionally stay at it with an eight or a nine or a 10 year old. But my second child, she's physical. She likes to push and wrestle and fight and, you know, like their own expression, but it's accelerating. They're, they're finding more and more of who they are because they're just operating out of receiving my love instead of trying to perform for me. And that's one of the things that stops people, stops Christians from stepping into their purpose. They're trying to perform for God. God doesn't need your performance. You know, even when people say, oh, the audience of one, perform for the audience of one. I don't know. Well, what are you performing for? You know, um, you think that when you're dancing in front of God that he's not getting up dancing with you. <laughs> the Bible says he's already dancing and rejoicing over you. You know, that some of that thinking's got to shift. Like, oh, look, at, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and perform and earn this thing from you, God. Like some of that stuff's got to go. You can't earn it. So this is this is something that I, I want to ask you because I just like I, I've always I've just thought about this and I've asked to some people, but just okay. So I've been watching the Chosen and watching you know just reading the the Gospels a lot more in the last couple of weeks, and you see you know Jesus and you know getting to the point where he's you know he he died he he paid the price for he he destroyed sin and death. Like he did all this stuff. He says, I've given you all authority. It's better that I go. You're going to do greater things. Jesus is like literally, like you said, the father, the father, and he's pushing it on us now. And, you know, the apostles did a great job. You know, they got it around India and Asia and they, you know, they got the gospel. But how does it get to the point where, you know, where it gets to the point where we just have it where, oh, you have to now you have to go back to the, you know, you know, the papacy, or you have to go to a priest to, you know, have your sins forgiven. Like what, what happened, what happened there? <laughs> and then what happened to where we are now, where we're just still like, where we still read the, you know, Jesus, I give you all authority and all, you know, heavenly, you know, authority to heal, cleanse the lepers, you know, give hope to the hopeless. Like what, what has happened and where have we just like dropped the baton? That's such a good question, bro. Like, I mean, I don't know, obviously, exactly where, who who can pinpoint that? You know, there's different times in history that are marked where certain leaders obviously made. The kings would uh, kind of make it yeah, illegal. Yeah, yeah, and uh, put decrees out and laws out. And it's just satanic in origin, right? Because the whole idea, again, is you need another mediator. But actually, you already have the only mediator you will ever need, which is Jesus. You already have him. And so... 
it is really interesting that it became like that. But I feel like, especially in the last four or five years, there's been a shift and mm -hmm. kingdom teaching is coming back. Kingdom understanding is coming back. Indi individual kingdom assignment is coming back. Sonship is more being understood. You know, um, the bride that Jesus is going to come for, these are people that learn how to love one another, honor one another, submit to one another. Even the fivefold is going to look different because there is no I'm above you. You know, I remember when I first heard the fivefold teaching, it almost sounded like the apostle is the greater. There is, mm -hmm. there is no greater. We are all in, in God. We are all the same. And that thing there where your identity, we're all the same. Our role, you have more, some have less. You have more, some have less. But it doesn't make you more valuable, you know. And so I think it's just where I don't know the exact time where all this happened, but I'm glad it's changing mm. now and i'm glad yeah. more kingdom teachings coming more family talk more of the bride more of the we are all one you know we're one body you know more of this is showing up which is good and so do you know uh brian simmons dr brian simmons of the passion translation do you ever read that translation yes I love so, that translation. so, so crazily two years ago, God told us to leave Dallas, leave my software sales job, my first like good job out of college and come to Wichita, Kansas. You know, it was about five hours North came here and I found the most unified spirit filled churches. All the pastors are unified. Denominations are being broken. There's like Kansas wide prayer and it's in the middle of the country. And there was like this prophecy that, you know, this, the Holy spirit was going to, you know, pour out all over and go revival to come out of Wichita and, in the middle of the country and you know expand to the rest of the nation and obviously i'm like oh well god told me i'm coming here so yeah let's i'm gonna be a part of it anyway so it's you know we've seen you know a lot of miraculous things amazing stuff um and then i guess what was i going to say oh and then ended up dr brian simmons was the on the apostolic oversight team of our church and so he you know he'll, he'll, he lives in wichita so it's i don't know and then pedro gets our mentor ends up getting connected with him with Dr. Brian Simmons and the wisdom challenge, that was just amazing. And then, you know, during that challenge, that was where I, you know, I made my first thousand dollars online, you know, just by just telling people, Hey, you guys come to this and just, um, you know, trying to help other people be like, you know, and even Dr. Brian Simmons is, you know, is launching a write a book challenge. And I, I see all these people helping the body of Christ come out with their expression of, has God told you to write a book? Has he told you to, you know, go do this. And, you know, so, um, I guess what I was going to ask you is this, uh, wh how do you know if that's God telling you to write a book or like, what is, what do you, how do you test that for yourself? That's or if it's just something I need to go, like I need to go write a book because, uh, I know, this... or, or like the title, like that when God speaks to you and tells you, Hey, write, you know, and, and also I wanted to talk about your book. Um, uh, the, what is it called? Over the abundance overflow. overflow, it's called yeah. overflow the no BS guide to the abundant life <laughs> yes come on see so not um, politically correct <laughs> yeah i mean he gave me that title i wrestled with it for a long time and then it was just bs you know it's like what's bs well bologna sandwich you know like really <laughs> really like i know people are going to read it like that for me i was like okay well i'm going to write it as no bs but i'm meaning bologna sandwich but it's going to grab people's head you know like some people didn't like it at all that i wrote that but mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're going to obey people or you're going to obey God. And so what, when, you know, everyone go get that book. It's an amazing book. What, what are some, you know, basic things they're going to get out of um, that book? And what was, and you said it, it, God gave you that and you wrote it in how long? I wrote the actual book in probably two weeks or under two weeks. And wow. then the whole, the whole process was about two months to publish it and get it out there and everything like that. Um, I, yeah, I, I want to hit one more thing, okay? Like, you talked about unity. I don't know why I'm feeling God, like, wanting me to bring up some of these subjects. Maybe it's for people listening here. But yeah, unity is really interesting because the whole body of Christ talks about unity. But we think unity is we should just come together and do something. You know, if, that, if it was that simple, then by now we would have had so much blessing because unity commands the blessing. That's what the Bible says. God's like, hey, if there's unity, like... It commands a blessing, but what's unity, you know? And um, I feel one thing that we don't understand is the only way that we can have unity is if we choose each other. I mm. must choose you. I can't just end up with you. I have to choose you, and you have to choose me. 
so much of church is just by default. Like, hey, I, I ended up in, you know, in the suburb, you're in the suburb. And so we kind of go to church together. That's how we know each other. But we don't move deeper into, I choose you, bro. You choose me. And when we choose each other, now we have real unity, which means I can choose not to choose you. And I can choose to just let you be somebody in this building or I can choose you. And um, I don't know, that's for somebody here, but that's the only way unity is going to come is where I know I don't have to be at church on Sunday. I don't know. I, don't, I know that I'm not going to hell just because I didn't come to church on Sunday, but I choose to be here and I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. And because we choose each other, there is a blessing that comes from that. And that's huge. And a lot of people don't explore that. The bride the bride that Jesus is coming back for, these are people that choose each other. The book wow. of Acts, they chose each other. And uh, I just want to bring up that fact because you can't have unity without freedom. And the freedom says, hey, Eric, I don't have to be your friend. I don't have to choose you. I don't have to choose anything to do with you. But in my freedom, I am choosing you. That's how we have unity. You know, That's why marriages, right? It's like, you know, I could be with any woman, but I choose you. I'm choosing you. You're choosing me. There's power and there's blessing in that choice. You know, and now we have unity. So I just wanted to throw that um, in there. Well, th I think that's what kind of the Lord was talking about is that unity. What I what I saw when I came out here, and I've never experienced it in Texas. And Texas has the most churches probably within a Dallas Fort Worth metroplex, but no unity. Everyone's like, no, we want those ties. We want those you know numbers. And it, and I you know we. You know, we served at some churches where it's just marketing and how do we get to the next level and how do we, you know, it's, it's how do we, you know, and it's just fancy, fancy stuff, stages and, you know, smoke. And anyways, um, so what was I going to say? Um, you, you asked me about my book. Let me, I'll just quickly yeah. hit that book thing. So, and this is why I talk about exploring, right? I actually began writing a book and this is the funniest joke. I wrote this, I was starting to write this book on a trip to India in 2018, must have been 2018, and um, yeah, 18, not 19, or 19, one of them, I was there, and I was writing this book called The Simplicity of Happiness, I was going to write this short book, it was going to be simple, and it was on the simplicity of happiness, as I started to write this book, and I started to do research and explore, the book became more about the book as opposed to my obedience. And as I explored, the book became so complicated, the subject. Like I called the book The Simplicity of Happiness and it became so complex, I stopped writing it. So wow. within about two weeks, I stopped writing it and I just left it. So a year later, when God says to me, you're going to write a book, I was just like, okay, what's it called? I'm not picking the title. You tell me what's it called. <laughs> and he's like, Overflow. It's, it's, the, it's a no BS guide to the abundant life. I was like, no BS guide? Like, can you say that? You know, and uh, I went through this journey, and the book's just filled with my own stories of uh, the abundant life because um, I went through a crazy time in 2017. It was actually four years of a crazy time, and then at the end, God just kind of released me and started to show me the abundant life that He has for everybody. And He spoke to me about your spirit, your soul, your body, your heart, your finances, and your purpose. These six things make up the abundant life, and it is for everybody. So I wrote the book and um, it's $3 on Amazon. You can grab it. It's blessed a lot of people. I hope it blesses you. And um, it's just got all my stories in there and some simple practical things you can do to start engaging uh, the six trees. I call them the six trees of the abundant life. So, Wow. So, and I know you said, you know, you know, non-comparison, all that stuff, but you have people who have the miracle morning and, you know, some people want to know what does Joseph do in the morning? When do you work out? And what, it, you know, what does that look like for you? Exercise. Yeah, it looks, it looks so different now that I have an eight week old baby. I can't get <laughs> up with so much energy. You know, like last night I barely slept because one of your kids wakes up, then she goes to sleep, then another kid wakes up, she goes to sleep, you know, and mm. I don't even know when I slept and how much I slept. And so, uh, I teach my clients this thing that I do every day called the baseline of success. And I'm going to go into all of this in the purpose challenge. Listen, you should jump in there. It's free. Okay. Um, the baseline of success is your spirit, your soul, your body, your heart every day, just doing five minutes towards that. And some people say five minutes, that's not enough. No, five minutes is enough. Cause if you do it every day, you will see massive compounding effects. Now, do I stop at five minutes? Usually I don't. But some days I have to, so I do stop at five minutes, but I've still done my baseline. 
So that that's how I work it. So I don't copy someone else's routine. You can't copy someone else's routine. For a long time, I tried to. I wanted to do the rocks routine. You know, Mark Wahlberg, Eric Thomas, these guys wake up 2.30 a.m., 3.30 a.m., 4.30 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jocko, 4.30 4 a.m. And they're like, I get my workout done, I get my meditation done, I get all this stuff done. I'm like, oh, man, like I feel like a failure because I'm trying mm. to put on soul's armor. Don't put on oh, soul's wow. armor. You're wow. free. Grab your sling. Grab your stones. Everyone might laugh, but you'll be the one that kills the giant. Come so on. morning routine, you got to make up your own morning routine. And um, yeah, exciting times. Wow, that's super awesome. Go get the book, Overflow. I dropped it in the comments and pinned it. Uh, and join the Purpose Challenge. Um, man, he, uh, Dose has been a huge blessing to my life, and I've loved seeing him. He's interviewed some amazing people. Go check him out on YouTube, uh, Fuse Life on YouTube. Uh, Wild Church, you interviewed Kirby. What was that like? What was the top what top couple of things you learned from Kirby on that YouTube <sighs> interview? Kirby. It was such an honor to even meet Kirby. So, I mean, this is a long story. I got to end soon because I got a coaching client. But um, just quickly with the Kirby story, I ended up seeing a poster of a conference that was going to be in Pittsburgh. And um, I was going to America for that conference. I was going to Dallas for the 100X conference because God was calling me there. And somehow the dates coincided. So long story short, I decided to go there just to see this Kirby guy. And then it turned out, that the person who was running the conference knew this other person who knew me as a child. So I got this full on inroad to, to go be a special wow. guest there. Yeah, total favor. When I get there, uh, Kirby preached and he left. And um, I was like, okay, Lord, well, if you want me to meet Kirby, you're going to make it happen. I was standing outside the hotel waiting for my Uber. And my Uber drives right past the hotel and goes from three minutes away to 10 minutes away. And I was like, God, what's going <laughs> on? It's late at night. I was getting angry because the Uber's gone. I'm like, this guy, is he is he high on weed or what? You know, and later it turned out that he was high on weed. <laughs> but when he went the wrong direction, I laughed and I said, imagine if if Kirby comes and I meet him now. That would be so funny, Lord. I turned around and Kirby came out the door and that's how I met Kirby. And um, God just totally set that thing up. So it's just cool to see Kirby's expression and then Chris Blackaby's expression and then Etienne Blum. Like I've had the privilege of having some people on my podcast that are amazing people and over the next three weeks i've got a whole bunch of people lined up so you should check out the podcast fuse life podcast i don't do it like a traditional podcast sometimes i have 10 episodes in two weeks you know that kind of thing and then sometimes i have no episodes so over the next uh, two to three weeks i have a lot of people lined up some billionaires well, well not billionaires but they handle billion dollar companies and um, i've got some amazing people coming on so make sure you check it out Awesome. Well, we're so excited. Everyone give a round uh, online clap for <laughs> Joseph. He's amazing. Well, God bless you. Um, and, and yeah, thank Eric, you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I'm excited for everything you're about to do, man. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I look forward to connecting with all the people that will listen to this. And I hope the people that know me will connect with you. And yeah, boom. Awesome, Joseph. Well, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Bless you guys. Talk soon. Thank you for being with us, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Joseph shared some amazing stuff. We are super excited. Keep up with us and stay tuned on Kingdom Passive Income with Eric Skeldon. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Spotify, and wherever podcasts are listened to. Thank you, guys, and we will see you soon.